All right, we're gonna move on to something fun. Sales. <laughs> Who here feels like in their heart of hearts they're salesmen or women? Yeah, yeah, the rest of you are like, nah, those are just irritating people we pay too much. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I found my tribe. They all sit in the middle because we know we can escape up the stairs. We know how you think. So I mentioned earlier um, this concept of a strategic tipping point. Inside all of our brains, a moment happens when we decide to buy from somebody or some company. It's called the strategic tipping point. In every deal that your company has closed, there was a moment in that selling process where your team did something to convince that prospect you were the right choice. There's a moment before, and then there's a moment after. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, oh, today's the day I decide on Microsoft. Doesn't happen. It's not how the brain works. There's a stimulus, and then there's a response. Does that all make sense? Right? So, if you think about a typical selling motion, regardless of whether it's a small transaction or large, and if you were to ask your sales team, where in this selling cycle do you do something that leads the prospect to want to buy from you? What stage do you think they might pick? How many people would say it sort of happens in qualified? Your sales team does something that during the qualification process convinces the prospect. How about during develop? <coughs> How about the solutioning exercise? Qualify. You pick qualify. How about proof? Yeah, most of the, I'm so confident that I've got to build. When I ask sales professionals, and I've worked with thousands of them, when in the sales cycle does the prospect decide to buy from you? Well, when they see whatever it is I'm selling. Now, there's obviously exceptions, right? but that's what I hear most of the time. Right? OK, so let's assume that the demo or the reference or the whatever it is that you provided as proof doesn't go so well. Not that that ever happens. There's only one place for the strategic tipping point to go, to the proposal. Right? Now, the reason I share this is because if you have a sales philosophy or a sales team that believes the strategic tipping point moment is going to occur near the end of their sales process. There's a number of psychological things that occur. Right? So as a business owner, this red line represents three things for you. Think about your own sales team. Right? If you have a sales team that believes the deal is one in the end, the red line represents one, your cost of sale. Right? So if I believe my deal is going to close in four months, I don't spend very much of your company money at the beginning, a bit of light lifting, but as I get to the end, whoa, I'm pulling in resources and, and doing unnatural acts, spending all kinds of money, right? That's your cost to sale equation. The second thing that it represents is your business risk. Because if the prospect has not had a strategic tipping point moment, you can't forecast it. It's impossible. If they don't know who they're going to buy from, how can you? And the third thing it represents is effort. Right? So sales professionals who wait for a late stage tipping point typically start slow and put all of their energy in at the end. Now, go back to the brain science. Premature cognitive commitment, the anchoring, the confirmation bias. Where in here do you think the brain is, is designed to make a decision? Right here. Yeah. It's not impossible to create a strategic tipping point moment in qualification. It's possible. But typically, sales professionals don't know enough about a deal and what they're looking for until they get to the end of develop, typically. Does that make some sense? Yeah. So. To actually drive a strategic tipping point early. Now, this is the interesting thing. I've done this with hundreds of partners all over the world. And when you map out their sales process on a whiteboard like this, and you step back at the end, and, and I'll ask them, hey, is this generally what you do? Yeah, it's, I got it all up there. Where do you think you win? What do you mean? No, I mean, where do you think you actually win the deal? 
when you do something that compels them to decide you're the one. Now, they don't jump out of their chair and say, oh, hey, just decided to let you know. You're now in the lead. I've never had it happen. Right? But what they will say is, well, it's something that we do and develop, always. You know, so to proactively drive sales closures at a higher win rate, we need to reorchestrate to do our best work in the beginning. Right? So that black line represents everything the red line represents. It's your effort. We need to drive a heavier level of effort at the beginning to orchestrate the strategic tipping point. We need to spend more of our cost of sale at the beginning rather than the end, and your business risk will go down because you will know coming out of the equivalent of develop, whether it's a three, a four, or a five step sales motion, you will know whether you've created some change. This turns solution selling on its head. Solution selling is designed around a belief that when I do something in proof, do a demo, proof of concept, something, I'm going to win the deal. The brain is not designed to do that. Now we could get away with it in the past because there was no way to see the software or see the solution without the salesperson showing it to them. Is that true today? No. You can get a trial of anything for as long as you like for nothing. Right? Solution selling will not work in the cloud. Full stop. Right. So, what I want to do is I want to share with you a couple of models that do work. Right, so this is typically what I see when I whiteboard a 20% win rate partner. I can do it in my sleep. The hardest part of doing this exercise with a partner is when I, you remember that question I asked earlier, how long do you spend in research? When they say, hey, 15 to 20 minutes, I'm like, oh god, I've got four hours ahead of me and I already know what it's going to look like. It's going to look like this. Lead comes in, sales professional does a bit of research, typically very little. Uh, then they get on the phone, the profiling process begins or the qualification. Uh, they'll generally speak for less than 30 minutes. Their objective is to get in front of the prospect as quickly as they can. That's their goal. The next thing that they do uh, is they, they meet for the first time. Uh, I call it a credentialing meeting. They talk about who they are. They try to learn a little bit about the opportunity. And, uh, and then they leave, and then there's another meeting that follows where you get kind of deeper into what is it that you're actually looking for, right? What is your solution? What are your business problems? And then they'll take that and they'll go back to the ranch and they'll build a solution internally, and then they'll do a demo. They'll provide some references if a demo is required, and then they'll build a proposal. Now, the bottom stream here is typically an inventory of sales assets that a company has developed that are somewhat similar. So there'll be a, a presentation that they deliver in PowerPoint when they show up for the first time. There'll be a statement of work. There'll be a project plan. There'll be a proposal that you know, is consistent. But there's generally very little consistency. Now, you don't have to raise your hand, but ask yourself if that looks familiar to you. Right? That's a 20% win rate. It's based on a belief that what happens at the end uh, drives the deal. Strategic tipping point that occurs over here. Just a quick question, though, on that slide. Yeah. So Yeah, so I'll just repeat that. It's a very, very good point. So if we go back to the two engagement points of buyer 2.0, for sure. So you may find at the end of qualify that this doesn't really belong here. It belongs back in long-term nurture. You could do that, but the psychology of sales professionals, and this is, this is a feature, I can close anything. And the more empty my funnel is, the more desperate I become to hold on to things that will never close. Anyone here have... Uh, opportunity in a CRM system that had an anniversary? <laughs> it's a year! What the heck? Yeah, so they don't have birthdays? Like, we don't... So yeah, so, but here, so here's the pro, here's one of the reasons that I, I highly encourage you to think about that marketing role as being the one who is responsible for triage is they're not looking to, to convert a deal. Like, they're just trying to get clear. And a, and, a, and, a, and a seasoned sales professional will get to the end of qualify, and then they'll qualify out and they'll send it back. But here's the problem. 
The human brain is not designed to teach and learn at the same time. Can't be done. Impossible. It's like a valve in there. So you're either teaching or you're learning. Now, if you're super experienced, you're probably generally better at dancing around stuff. Right? But you're going to be teaching or learning. So the problem with this model is that there's no learning done in qualified. The sales professional is looking for the four or five reasons why this is good for them. And then they're going to do their best work by showing up physically on site where they're really good. And then they're going to bring out their 14 PowerPoints and they're going to put the prospect to sleep. The first thing I do with sales teams, I kill their PowerPoints. You want to create distance with human beings, you put a PowerPoint in front of them. You kill that, you use that. Right? That's, so that's another discussion for another day. But so this thing up here is if you have not done your learning in the qualification phase, well then you can't really teach anything in meeting number one. And so what you end up doing is more learning and then you end up going back into meeting two to do more learning and you never get an opportunity to teach and if you can't teach, you can't get beyond 20%. So what does this mean? <clears throat> Bold statement. A lot of the salespeople that you have working for you today will not be employed in a couple of years. Maybe sooner, some of you are saying. Yeah. Why? Because if you can't teach a prospect something new, you don't earn the right to the next meeting. You're column B. Right? So more and more of the sales professionals, Brent alluded to this as early today, they have content. Like they're coming in with industry knowledge, some domain knowledge. The selling process itself is relatively simple and straightforward when you have a package solution for an industry. Right? So, so content is king. It's impossible to be an industry expert across all industries. Right? So there's no opportunity to teach. All you can do if you're focused on all industries is service the buying cycle. Now, I'm going to gross most of you out because I want you to remember this. And I can do it because I did this for probably three years of my sales career. Right? Servicing the buying cycle means I do whatever you ask me to do. I call it bootlicking selling. Hey, Mark, hey, can you fill out this RFI? Sure. Hey, are those nice and shiny for you? Oh, hey, Mark, good news. You've made the short list of 16. Can you fill out this 400 line RFP? Yeah, I can, but can I meet with some people in the company? Gets a perspective on what the, that's not possible. Yeah, but it's kind of hard to fill out an RFP unless I know what you're looking for. Mark, we have a process in place. Okay. Maybe, maybe the, then you fill out your, hey, good news, Mark, you're down to the short, short list of six. Here's a demonstration script. Huh? No, I'd like to meet with the company. I'd like to, I need to know more. How long is a piece of string, remember? Like I need to, it's not possible. Or you can submit some questions, or you can get, you can meet with the IT people, but you can't talk to the business. Okay. By the time you get to the end of this thing, you're dehydrated. <laughs> right? Here's your proposal. You know, you're just dust in your mouth. You're done. Hey, we need a pricing discount, okay. Right? You, you, you've, stepped, you've, stepped, you've stepped into the master-slave relationship from the beginning. 20% sales professionals, and this has nothing to do with their skills, they're not, well, part of their skills, but it's nothing to do with their knowledge. These are smart people. They're following an old model. Unless you can teach your prospects something new, you cannot get above 20%. Right? Bold statement. So moving forward, if you think about the skill sets that we all needed to execute a solution selling model, light on the front end, bit light on the back end, emailing proposals, right? all the work in the middle trying to find some unique solution set that consumed a bunch of project services hours. The world that we're moving into looks a little bit different. Now that does not mean that the middle isn't <coughs> important, but go back to the psychology of primacy and recency. The most important meetings in a deal, psychologically, are the beginning and the end. Those two are the single most important sessions. Now the back end one is a little bit easier because we've been working with them for a while. But the beginning is where the mistake is made. Now, 
this becomes important today because of the cloud buyer. And so again, you go back a few years, if they wanted a price, there was nowhere to go but through me, the sales guy. If you wanted a demo, there's no way to get one unless you went through me and my process. And we would negotiate access to executives for visibility into my product. But they don't need us for that anymore. They can see the product, they get the pricing from other places, there's no mysteries out there. You know, so, so we need to think about that front end of the sales process in a radically different way. We need to do our best work at the beginning, front end load, right? And, 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 and all sales professionals can retool. But unless you find a way to be able to teach a prospect something new, all you can do, and you can do it well, service the buying cycle. Oh, it hurts me. I think about times in my life when I've had to do it. And then you get to the end and you're like, hey, I didn't win. Yeah, but I did everything you asked me to do. Yeah, we appreciate that. We just needed something to negotiate a real price with with somebody else. So I'm going to share with you at a very high level. I'm going to wrap up my piece at around four. There are three motions for sales in the cloud. You have to map one of these motions to what you want to sell. Right? So in the past, we've had solution selling, five steps, and we've sort of applied it to everything. Whether we sold services or whether we sold products, qualify, develop, solution, proof, and close. And it worked. But it doesn't work anymore. So my belief is that each of you, when you think about building your solution that differentiates yourself in the market, you're going to land on one of three places. One, uh, I have a, a, a highly repeatable, right, non-customizable solution set that I want to sell a lot of at a low cost. Right? That means I'm not limited to my local geography. I sell this primarily over the phone. How many people are contemplating something like that? High volume, right? So you need a selling motion uh, that is orchestrated around that. It's a three-step process. I use basic language, qualify, proof, and close. Right? And, and the front end load is where the work is. To do that, if you look under the repeatable motion, uh, there's, there's a number of pre-configured assets. The more you can configure these assets for industry, the more powerful they are. And, and the reason for that is, every interaction that the prospect has with you makes it seem like you know them intimately. Every interaction. So the alignment email that you send out looks like it was written specifically for them. The demonstration <laughs> plan that you send them looks like it's specifically for their industry and it teaches them something new. The proposal that you configure looks like it's designed just for their problems. Right? But you can't do that when you're chasing 46 different industries. Right? So the magic to repeatability is the repeatable assets themselves. And you can also take a relatively inexperienced sales professional at a low cost base and make them sound like they're conversationally competent in an industry in a very short period of time. Right? So that's the configuration of this repeatable solution set. For clarity, highly prescriptive. That's the approach. It's not a tell us what you want and we'll see if we can build it for you. It's like, look, we got three packages. You want to buy one of them and I'm going to talk you out of any silly decisions to kind of go outside the box. It's about collecting customers at scale. There are partners all over the world executing this stuff here, right? Primarily in Europe because they've been forced to earlier. Now, the second one, the prescriptive, is a little bit more like an ISV solution set. But don't get wrapped up in the acronym. Right? It is still highly prescriptive in that you built a solution set to solve a defined set of business challenges, but there's a sufficient element of complexity or the cost that justifies a physical face-to-face on-site visit. It doesn't have to happen, but generally if this is a $20,000 or a $50,000 solution, that's a $200,000 to $400,000 solution. And I don't know anybody that wants to spend two hundred to four hundred thousand dollars without seeing who they're buying from, right? So there's that extra step in the middle where you physically go on site, but the solution is still highly prescriptive. It doesn't mean that you don't sell project services; you do, but it's not your purpose. And there's more productization in there. And the third one, of course, is the disruptive selling motion, and that replaces solution selling. It is also highly prescriptive, but <laughs> It's a big deal, 
Every company is a little bit different. You got integration into different systems. You got different data models. You got different this, different that. Right? So there's still a fair bit of customization to it, but you are bringing a solution set to market and you're encouraging the prospect to consume it as much as possible out of the box. Right? So that's a conscious shift. Are there still companies out there that will pay you to build something unique and special just for them? Yes, and, and, and take their money as long as you can. But I will tell you, today's buyer wants to consume their technology as quickly as possible. They want to buy industry or, or vertical or workload configured solution sets as much as they can. They want limited risk. They're tired of the endless projects that have anniversaries themselves and they're tired of all the surprises. So to the degree that you can bring something to market like that, you're very interesting to them. How many people, again, show of hands, kind of feel like they're doing, gonna do something around the repeatable? Just wanna get a sense. How many people sort of feel like they're in the next one? Prescriptive, bigger deals. And how many people are still going after sort of the, you know, the complex stuff? Yeah, still a few of those, right? So, so just be clear that, you, that you're gonna need a different selling motion that aligns with each of those sort of go-to-market strategies. Does that make sense? But, but what's consistent across all of them is, A, be prescriptive, understand what it is that the problem you're solving. The second thing is configure the underlying assets so that they're reusable, repeatable, and it will force you to think through what it is that you're actually solving. Right? And the third thing is understand that the bigger project services, the bigger the risk, the lower the close rate. So you got a business to run. Many of you have a lot of project services that are part of the overall revenue structure. So you got to kind of balance that out. How much do I want to consume of my own project services in the form of reusable IP? One has a higher margin structure, right? Uh, the other one gets me probably a higher win rate. Now, underneath all this stuff is some other content for you. All of these assets that we've got listed up here, they're guides I wrote about how to configure those underlying assets. Those are all on the URL, the website that I shared with you. We're gonna get it up on here again before the end of the day, in case anyone didn't get it. So all of those underlying assets have been developed. You just need to configure them for your own business. And they're all linked in that thing. I think the biggest portion of the business that's gonna get disrupted moving forward is services. How many people, show of hands, have the majority of their revenue coming in from services? Uh, yeah, it's kind of a, just to make sure I'm in the right room. <laughs> so there's three types of services, and they align with three stages of the buying journey. If you actually look at it from a customer's perspective, there is a period of time where they have to pick a solution. Business problem to, I'm going to pick one of these vendors. Then there's an implementation time frame. I picked one, and then it goes to go live. And then there's the third piece, which is what happens after go live. Now, if you think about the service offerings that you have today and you line them up with those three phases of the customer life cycle, you've got to ask yourself the question is, do I have an offering in each of those categories? So how many people today have something to help customers pick the right solution? De-risk, yeah. How many people have implementation services? Yeah, da-da. Right now, how many people have some form of post-deployment, post-go-live service that is not reactive? So think about a proactive service that delivers value. Fantastic. This is the magic, by the way, of differentiation. Are you talking about the customer So that would be the title, right? So it, someone that is maniacally focused on ensuring that the business case that justified that investment actually happens. Because the cost of customer acquisition in terms of payback, best case scenario in the cloud is about 12 months right now. Most partners, it's closer to 18 months, could be up to 24 months, which is the break even point of recapturing the money you spent to collect that customer in the first place. Because you're obviously collecting your revenue on a subscription basis. It's coming back in slowly. So if we do not have optimization services that are maniacally focused on ensuring that our customers get the value they expected, your churn rate will increase. Or they'll stick with what they have and they won't expand. They won't drive more consumption. So when I work with partners around this model, what I found is that it's relatively easy to wrap our heads around 
the selection services for sure, right? So, so put some form of packaged offer. It's five grand. It's ten grand. And, and when you identify a risk in the discovery process, you say, hey, run into us all the time. We've got a packaged offer. It's a one-week engagement. You come out the other end with clarity. You can give it to all of our competitors. But you're going to have a lower risk, higher value project. I sold those personally for about 10 years and delivered them. I'm a passionate believer. Right? The high win rate. Whoever you sell a $5,000 deal, you win the deal. Right? So, so, but it's about packaging it up. Right? Have a website, landing page, have a brochure, have a facilitator. I can't, I can't. You're vibrating. Process managed services. It's not managed services, business process services. It is just sitting there waiting to be linked. And that is after the sale. Mm -hmm. And that is where we're all going to make money. Yeah. That is the only place that I want to go. Yeah. So, so I'm so delighted. I could package it. It's the packaging. I didn't pack it. I wasn't thinking about yeah. packaging it. So, how many people, again, show of hands, have some form of selection service? How many of you have packaged it with a brochure? About half the people. So just package it up. Pretend like you do it every day. And you look for the risk in the project, not why they're going to buy from you. And then you position this selection service. Keep it focused on the business community. Keep it focused on risk reduction. Keep it focused on the business case. Right. So that's the easier part. Everybody knows how to implement stuff. Nothing magical in there, although I would encourage you to try to create repeatable processes, turn it into IP. It's a pedestrian body of work. But the magic sits in the optimization service. So if I was selling, working for you today, I was your salesperson, I would walk into a company with this whiteboard. I would say, here's why you want to buy from us. Here's the three phases of your experience. You're going to go through a period of time where you're going to interview us and look for one. You're going to implement. And then there's a period of time we're going to use it. And here is your decision, and here's your go live moment. The reason you want to work with us is because we don't just focus on the middle. We've got a packaged offering up here that de-risks you making the, right, the wrong choice. And it's important because in the discovery work we've done with your team, we've identified this risk. Right? A, a good outcome at the end of the selection service is, an, is you decide to kill the project. That's actually a good outcome. I say that all the time. But the real reason you want to work for us is be work with us is because our project doesn't actually start until go live. Anybody around the world can do the implementation. Our organization is maniacally focused. We've developed a packaged offering to drive value with you. We also have the reactive stuff that you need to make sure everything runs appropriately. But we're going to proactively force you to meet on a regular basis to talk about your business priorities and look for ways of optimizing the asset that you already own. And you're going to pay for that. And that's a high value resource. It's very hard to deliver and package that up across multiple industries. It's a lot easier to do with a focus. Does that make sense? All right. So blah, 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 blah. Examples of those just in case you need them. Here's some companies in your ecosystem delivering selection services. Here's a bunch of organizations that are automating the crap out of the middle piece. Right? And here's an inventory of all of the assets that we put together that you can modify. They're all available in their raw format. So these are the ways that you drive consistency and repeatability across your sales motion.